Hello, welcome to Sabbath School with Branch Davidians. I'm Ed, and I'm here with my wife, Mary. Hello, we're excited you're joining us today. Yes, thanks for listening. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School Quarterly each week. This quarter is on the Book of Ephesians. This week's lesson is entitled, The Unified Body of Christ, and focuses in on Ephesians 4, 1-16. through Wednesday's lesson is on the gifts of the exalted Jesus, and has us read verses 11 through 13. We will read to verse 14. Quote, He gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some shepherds and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, to the work of serving, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a full-grown man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may no longer be children, tossed back and forth, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in craftiness, after the wiles of error. Close quote, Ephesians 4, 11-14. The lesson then comments, He, Jesus, gives to his church first apostles, second prophets, third evangelists, fourth shepherds and teachers. The structure of the Greek phrase suggests these are a single group. Christ gives these gifts to accomplish important work, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12. And until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. And that's Sabbath School Quarterly Lesson, Wednesday, August 9th, 2023. The lesson statement here that the structure of the Greek phrase of verse 11, which lists the different gifts, suggests these are a single group, is similar to what we brought to light in last week's study, called, Are We Satisfied to Have All Our Prophets Dead Prophets? which we will link in the description, that the gifts are all given together and all have an equal duration of application. In other words, as long as we should expect to have evangelists and shepherds, we should expect to have prophets and apostles as well. They all are necessary parts of the body and rely on each other in order to function effectively. And this, as the lesson notes, is simply taking the Greek sentence of verse 11 as it reads. The lesson then points out that the SDA pioneers understood it this way as well, as we also evidenced in last week's study by reading the Introduction to Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, by Roswell Cottrell, which was commissioned by Ellen White and published under her as well. The lesson this week proves this point from the writings of a different pioneer, Uriah Smith. The lesson reads, quote, This last point was of special importance to early Adventists, who were reflecting on the spiritual gifts of Ellen G. White. Does the Bible validate the functioning of the gift of prophecy in the church only during the time of the apostles? Or does the gift continue until the return of Christ? The early Adventists found their answer in Ephesians 4.13 and shared it through a story about the captain of a ship who was bound to follow the instructions provided for a voyage. As the ship neared port, the captain found that the instructions informed him that a pilot would come on board to help guide the vessel. To remain true to the original instructions, he must allow the pilot to board and obey the further guidance offered. And then the lesson quotes Uriah Smith saying, quote, Who now heed that original book of directions? Those who reject the pilot? Or those who receive him? as that book instructs them. Judge ye. Close quote, and that's from Uriah Smith's article, Do We Discard the Bible by Endorsing the Visions? Published in the Review and Herald, January 13th, 1863, page 52. And what we just quoted was from the Sabbath School Quarterly Lesson from Wednesday, August 9th, 2023. Here we see that Uriah Smith was making the argument that according to the instructions given to the captain, which obviously represents inspired scripture, there was to be a pilot on board to help guide the vessel, and that the captain and everyone else was to obey the pilot. 
Let's read a little bit more from this article in the review and herald by Uriah Smith. He wrote, quote, Suppose we are about to start upon a voyage. The owner of the vessel gives us a book of directions, telling us that it contains instructions sufficient for our whole journey, and that if we will heed them, we shall reach in safety our port of destination. Setting sail, we open our book to learn its contents. We find that its author lays down general principles to govern us in our voyage, and instructs us, as far as practicable, touching the various contingencies that may arise till the end. But he also tells us that the latter part of the journey will be especially perilous, that the features of the coast are ever-changing by reason of quicksands and tempests. But for this part of the journey, he says, I have provided you a pilot who will meet you and give you such directions as the surrounding circumstances and dangers may require, and to him you must give heed. With these directions, we reach the perilous time specified, and the pilot, according to promise, appears. But some of the crew, as he offers his services, rise up against him. We have the original book of directions, say they, and that is enough for us. We stand upon that and that alone. We want nothing of you. Who now heed that original book of directions? Those who reject the pilot or those who receive him? As that book instructs them, judge ye. And that's from Uriah Smith, Do We Discard the Bible by Endorsing the Visions? Review and Herald, January 13th, 1863, page 52. Now you might think that Uriah Smith was using the pilot as a symbol of Ellen White in particular, but it turns out that the very next thing he said in this article shows he had something broader in mind. He said, quote, But some, through lack of perception or lack of principle or the ebullitions of an unconquerable prejudice, one or all combined, may meet us at this point like this. Then you would have to take Sister White as our pilot, would you? It is to forestall any efforts in this direction that this sentence is penned. We say no such thing. What we do say is distinctly this, that the gifts of the Spirit are given for our pilot through these perilous times, and whenever and in whomsoever we find genuine manifestations of these, we are bound to respect them, nor can we do otherwise without in so far rejecting the word of God, which directs us to receive them, who now stand upon the Bible and the Bible alone. Close quote. Clearly, Uriah Smith believed that Ellen White had the prophetic gift, but he didn't think it would be necessarily limited to her. His view was, as the lesson said, that the gift of prophecy would continue until the return of Christ. Now, Smith's point is that those who rebelled against the pilot fallaciously root their rebellion in the fact that they had the original book of directions. All they want and need is that original book or so they tell themselves, so they reject the pilot's guidance. Of course, Uriah Smith is pointing out the rebellion's inconsistency with itself. On one hand, the rebellion accepts the book of directions as authoritative, but at the same time rejects the book's authority and that they rebel against the book's direction to have a pilot, the prophetic gift active in their midst. Basically, Uriah Smith is pointing out the rebellion's inconsistency with their own position. By rejecting the need for a prophet, they are rejecting the very thing that they point to as the basis for their own position. How ironic. The lesson then has a discussion question which reads, quote, Read Isaiah 5.4, which reads, What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Think about this verse in the context of what God has given us in the ministry of Ellen G. White. How does it apply? Close quote, Sabbath School Quarterly Lesson, Wednesday, August 9th, 2023. Well, one implication here could be that God has given his vineyard, his church, the prophetess Ellen White in the 1800s and early 1900s. And in view of this, what more could he possibly give us? But this idea has its problems. Primarily that Isaiah 5.4 was written well before the time of Ellen White, well before the time of John the Revelator, or the Apostle Paul, or even Jesus. Couldn't any Jew in the first century with this logic have used Isaiah 5.4 to say, we have the ministry of Isaiah, to them the writings of Isaiah, why do we need Jesus? 
After all, in Isaiah 5, 4, God said that he couldn't have given us anything more than he already had. Isaiah 5, 4 was written before and concerning the impending Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom and is obviously not saying to that audience that God had given all the prophets he was ever going to give to his vineyard. God hadn't even given Christ yet. What is quite easy to see from his context is that God was saying to the people of Isaiah's day that he had given them everything that they needed to produce sweet, cultivated grapes, a glorious vineyard, instead of the wild, sour grapes, verse 2, which the vineyard was producing. This rebuke included the fact that they were not following the instructions in the instruction book, verse 24, which no doubt included the fact that they were not listening to the pilot they were given at the time, even Isaiah. See Isaiah 30, verses 9 through 11. Now to be clear, we are not saying that the Sabbath school lesson is necessarily trying to imply this. But be that as it may, there is the possibility of a subtle implication in this discussion question that undermines the point Uriah Smith was making, as was brought out by the rest of Wednesday's lesson. That is, the instruction book says we need the prophetic gift on board until Christ returns. To deny this is to deny the position of the instruction book. Would any SDA argue that we have reached our port of destination in safety? Doubtful. Then we must be consistent with our own position as laid out by Uriah Smith and recognize that we aren't following the instruction book if we aren't making sure to accept God's appointed pilot and heed their instructions. This story by Uriah Smith distinguishes the writings of the prophets, which is what the instruction book is, and having a prophet active on board, a living pilot through whom God gives sailing instructions in these times that are ever-changing which is present truth that the flock needs now. And on this point, we are now going to look at an amazing similarity between Uriah Smith's story and something Ellen White was reported to say a few months before her death on the topic of a future successor. First, as we just read, Uriah Smith describes the instruction book of Scripture by saying it contains instructions sufficient for our whole journey. As we are about to read, Ellen said basically the same thing about her writings as her life was coming to an end. So a few months before her death, Ellen was asked some questions concerning, well, her death. The following is an account by one of the leading workers at the time who had the opportunity to meet with her in her final days at her home in Elmshaven. This account we're reading is in the book Ellen G. White, The Later Elmshaven Years, 1905 through 1915, Volume 6, by Arthur White. It reads, quote, When Elder Campbell asked her if she had any light as to whether she would live till Jesus returned, she replied that she had no light on the matter. When he expressed his concern as to the welfare of the cause in her absence, she quietly replied, The Lord is perfectly able to take care of his cause. He then asked whether in the event she was called to her rest, another would be raised up to take her place. Several of her books were lying on the writing table attached to her chair. Campbell reports that she spread her hands over them and said that in those books was outlined the information needed by our people for the rest of the journey. She chose to go no further in comment regarding a possible successor. And that's from DF 108, M.N. Campbell, Report of an Interview with Sister White, February 3rd, 1943. Wow, Ellen reportedly said basically the same thing about her writings that Uriah Smith said about the instruction book of Scripture. She spread her hands over them, her books of instruction, and said that in those books was outlined the information needed by our people for the rest of the journey. Was she expressing the same sentiment as those who justified their rejection of the pilot by pointing to the fact that they had the instruction book? Or was she simply saying the same thing about her writings that Uriah Smith said about the instruction book? Clearly the latter. In other words, her reported words don't indicate there is no more need for a pilot on board. Rather, they indicate that the writings contain the instructions we need, part of which is the scriptural teaching that we should expect and heed the prophetic gift until Jesus' second coming. 
and in Ellen's written works, and additionally in the written works of pioneers like Roswell Cottrell, as we evidenced from last week, and Uriah Smith from this week, you will certainly see that the early STAs understood the need for a pilot on board, the gift of prophecy active, in other words, manifested through a living prophet, in the church to guide the vessel, the church, safely to its final destination. We'll close with something from Ellen White's book, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3. This part serves as an introduction to the book and is aptly entitled Spiritual Gifts and was written by James White. He wrote, quote, We present as the groundwork of the scriptural doctrine of the perpetuity of the spiritual gifts, the original commission, Mark 16, 15 through 20, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which he quoted. Now he says, This high commission relates to the gospel, to faith, to baptism, to salvation, and to spiritual gifts. The gospel was to be preached as long as there were sinners to hear it. Faith is equally requisite throughout the Christian age. Baptism is a perpetual ordinance in the church, and the ministers of the 19th century baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, because the original commission requires it. The terms of salvation stated in this commission were to be held out as long as sinners might be saved. Running parallel with all these, we find in the same commission, spiritual gifts. In the absence of proof that the gifts were to be restricted to any particular age of the Christian church, this commission alone is sufficient evidence of their perpetuity. Close quote. Again, that's from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 9, paragraphs 1 through 4. Now, for a deeper study on this, please see What is the Spirit of Prophecy, STA edition by Trent Wilde, linked in the description. Thank you for staying with us till the end. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com, to learn more about who we are and, just as important, who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath School studies. And if you want to keep up with our new studies as they're published, we recommend subscribing. We're on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on plenty of other podcast apps. Links for subscribing are in the description. God bless. Many blessings.